So Dr. Joseph Walter is the director of the Asian Studies Center and professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh. He also serves as the editor of uh, the Journal of Asian Studies, which is the official publication of the Association for Asian Studies and the flagship journal on, in its field. His research focuses on modern yoga, and he's currently studying the way in which yoga and uh, nature cure establish an ecology of the body within the rubric of public health. He is also the academic director of the PIT in the Himalayas program. So um, we are thrilled to have you, uh, Dr. Alter, um, and um, are very excited, uh, as I said uh, before, to uh, learn more about yoga and how it can add to our wellness. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. And it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here uh, this afternoon, uh, joining you uh, on this occasion to uh, engage in a conversation, which is something that is really very dear to my own heart, which is to uh, improve uh, education for all levels, uh, you know, ranging from uh, pre-kindergarten all the way up through uh, retirement, which I am approaching very, very rapidly. But uh, it's a great uh, uh, opportunity for me to present uh, some of my work on yoga as it relates to questions that many of you may have because you have heard about yoga or have done yoga in some form or another. Uh, and are interested in learning about uh, what its historical background is. So I'm going to talk today about yoga and the body very broadly to help to put together the various dimensions of yoga that cross cut different forms of practice. And I'll use several examples of modern synthesis from my own research to illustrate this. But let's start with this. Most of you who have uh, practiced yoga will probably be familiar with this pose. And since we're not all sitting in a room, I won't ask you to shout out what it is, but I can assure you that most of you would immediately say it is a downward dog, correct? No, this is a downward dog. This is an upward dog. Now, the point of this humorous intervention is not to poke fun at yoga at all, but to really get us to think about really fundamental questions about how it has become something that is very different from what it was invented to be in many respects. That is, how do we get from enlightenment to the downward facing dog? Because enlightenment is obviously a very abstract concept uh, that is very cosmic in its scale and scope. And the practice of yoga is directly oriented towards achieving enlightenment. And there's a whole spectrum of scholarship on this. Some of the books that I have written explore this in various ways. Uh, comparative scholars of religion, Mircea Eliade has written extensively on trying to uncover the long history of yoga. David Gordon White has written about yoga in relation to alchemy. Uh, Jeffrey Samuel has tried to explore the relationship between ritual forms of practice. David White has talked about the classical scriptures that uh, outline yoga in very arcane terms. And James Mallinson and uh, Mark Singleton have explored the roots of yoga. And yet, despite all of this very sophisticated scholarship, when we look at yoga in contemporary practice, in gymnasiums, in studios, it takes shape in practice in ways that beg really important questions about what people are trying to achieve when they engage in yoga. This incidentally is um, Bikram Chaudhary, the inventor of hot yoga, who developed a multi-billion dollar industry in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s, uh, who has run into all kinds of troubles as a consequence of cultural appropriation and the distortion of yoga in practice. But how do we get into understanding that and this kind of yoga in mass practice 
in studios all over the world? And also, how do we understand the link between yoga's global spread and the claims that are made by practitioners in India, none less than the prime minister himself practicing yoga here, that yoga is a distinct Indian tradition of self-transformation that promotes health, wellness, and enlightenment. Enlightenment is this goal that underlies all forms of yoga in some way or the other. And the best way to understand enlightenment is in terms of the sacred geography of Southern Asia in which yoga developed. The idea of yoga is intimately connected to the idea of leaving the world as we experience it in order to experience its transcendent cosmic dimensions. And leaving the world is based on the assumption that the world that we all live in is a world of misperception. And so renouncing the world as individuals such as this seek to do is a way of getting beyond the misperception of the world around us. And yet yoga in practice in contemporary India and in many parts of the world has been medicalized. That is, it's used as therapy. This is one of the most important figures in the history of yoga in 20th century India, demonstrating the techniques of practice in his clinic in Mumbai in the 1920s, using the power associated with enlightenment to produce medical benefits. And not only med medical benefits, but physical fitness and wellness more broadly. This is the same individual here teaching a class, yoga, in order to promote good citizenship. That is not to allow these individuals who look like they're touching their toes to achieve enlightenment, but to draw on the power that is manifest in the body oriented towards enlightenment to become better citizens of the world through the embodiment of the ideals and principles associated with yoga. And science then comes into the picture in a very particular way, which is to prove on some level, and this is in a scientific laboratory in India in the 1920s, to try and prove that the practice of yoga can actually transform the body in order to enable it to achieve what those who claim to have achieved enlightenment say that it can do. So trying to use the empirical methods of science to prove the efficacy of yoga. Now, very briefly, I want to lay a foundation before we get into some of the forms of medical practice to understand how enlightenment is conceptualized. Um, the earliest texts that outline this in any detail are from the second century of the Common Era, and they have to do with a theory of experience, which holds that people are entangled in a world that is fundamentally an illusion. That is, everything around us, everything we experience is, in some sense, not the reality that really matters. And yoga, to achieve enlightenment, is designed to produce an experience that gets us beyond the illusion of everything that gets in our way of seeing reality as we should see it. So yoga is a means to the end of transcending the illusion of maya. Now, there's this complex philosophy that provides the rational support for that. And I don't want to go into it in great detail, except to say that in the philosophy of yoga, creation is a problem. It's not the beginning of the emergence of reality. 
it is a kind of devolution. And in a word, what yoga is designed to do is to work backwards through our misperception of reality to enable us to embody a state of embodied mind that puts us back in touch with the reality which transcends the illusion of creation. Now, admittedly, this is a very different way of viewing things from the way in which many people view it all over the world, including in India. But it's important to appreciate the extent to which what yoga is trying to do is undo the process of creation. It's trying to undo creation in order to transcend illusion. Keeping that in mind, one of the best ways to understand how yoga takes shape in practice is in terms of this concept of two bodies. In the practice of yoga, there is a gross body that is the body that we all inhabit on an everyday basis. The body that you feel if you stub your toe, the body that you feel if you're hungry, the body that you feel when you're getting tired and want to go to sleep. Uh, parallel with that is something conceptualized as the subtle body. And the subtle body is very real, but it's a parallel structure to the gross body. An example can be useful in illustrating how this works. Air, even though we don't think of it as something which is gross, is literally gross in the sense that it has material properties associated with it. So air is the gross aspect of nature. Yoga is designed to connect air, the air that we breathe, to the kind of subtle dimension of air that is the essence of life as it is manifest in our being. So the gross and the subtle are intimately connected to one another and are in a relationship in which they are transformed from one into the other. The transformation of the gross body, including the mind into the subtle body, produces something called samadhi, which is the physical embodiment of immortality, purity, and perfect balance. It's the physical manifestation of enlightenment. And the individuals who embody this, going back to this figure here, a world renouncer who has left this reality to go into the other dimension, is quite literally somebody who has transcended the illusion of life, or at least that's how it's conceptualized. And yoga, in essence, is the method by which you can activate that achievement. That is how you can transcend reality. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the different dimensions of yoga in practice, which is a whole ethical way of life, but I want to focus on the two dimensions which are most commonly experienced by people who practice yoga in different contexts and are most directly relevant to appreciating how this notion of enlightenment transforms into medical therapy and wellness, and that is asana postures and pranayama. Many of you who have taken classes in yoga are familiar with the techniques of pranayama, which are in essence breathing exercises, quite literally the gross physical practice of breathing in a very regulated way, either in terms of the classical representation of this down in the bottom left or a modern practitioner on the right. But pranayama is very graphically the transformation of air into subtle energy. And the better you get at being able to do that, the purer and more physically fit in the philosophical sense your body becomes. And so these images are simply meant to draw attention to the way in which pranayam, breathing exercises, are a technique for purifying 
the body mind as an integrated whole. And they're directly linked to a broader cultural context within which yoga makes sense, which is the context of self purification in the ritual and religious world of India. And so yoga is a particularly individual form of self integrated practice, which is metaphorically directly linked to the idea of bathing ritually in sacred rivers. Many of you will have heard of Hatha yoga or physical practices, the asana postures. Literally Hatha yoga means forceful yoga. In other words, it's a technique designed to transform the gross body forcefully into the subtle body and to purify the body to stop all the normal processes of change and transformation in order to make the body become immortal or so healthy that it is the equivalent of more, uh, immortal. And what this does is to generate, at least as it's described in the literature on yoga, the physical power to withstand the force of enlightenment. In other words, the practice of postures and breathing exercises is quite literally physical fitness training in order for a person to be able to develop the mental and physical prowess to be able to withstand the tremendous discharge of energy that's associated with enlightenment. And again, just to review, there are two parallel bodies, the subtle invisible, pure, transcendent body and the gross, tangible, strong body that is ensnared in the world of the illusion. And yoga is the transformation of gross into subtle. What this generates, at least as it's described in the medieval literature on forceful yoga, are magical powers. Now, here's where it gets into some interesting territory in the sense that many people who practice yoga try and ignore the fact that the literature really puts a great deal of emphasis on its magical potential. And what they mean by magic in the context of this literature is defying the laws of nature in order to gain power over the natural world. And what this does in the literature is describe how practitioners of yoga can levitate, can uh, perform clairvoyance, be in two places at the same time. But fundamentally, the goal is not to achieve those kinds of magical powers, but to stop all of the processes of transformation. But if you look at these individuals here, if you can see the GIF, which at least on my screen is moving, these are practitioners who are engaged in something called yogic flying. Now, yogic flying is a physical method of doing what people imagine levitation to do if you have the magical power to levitate. But I think most of us who are viewing this, these guys are hopping across a mat, look at it and are immediately skeptical. We say they're not levitating at all. They're simply hopping in a way that you can learn to hop if you practice hard enough. The point of putting it that way is to highlight the connection between the gross body, which is what we're looking at here, and the possibility of transcending that which brings us, you might say, with a sigh of relief to postures, asana, the things that most of you who have done yoga or have met somebody who is really into yoga does and does in a very determined and deliberate fashion. Asana are postures. They're deliberately designed to transform the body in a way that is empowered by the energy that is animated through Pran and the force of enlightenment. But here's where it gets really interesting in terms of then how this transformation through the practice of postures becomes relevant to wellness and to um, 
um, uh, medical treatment. The famous comparative scholar of religions, Mircea Eliade, who studied yoga in the 1920s in India and then wrote a book which was published in the early 1930s, said very definitively, perfection is always the goal of doing postures such as this. And as we shall see, it's never there, neither athletic nor hygienic perfection. Hatha yoga cannot and must not be confused with gymnastics, Mircea Eliade says. And yet that is exactly what practitioners have done. In other words, practitioners of yoga insist that doing a posture such as this is good for you in the physiological sense that practitioners of yoga derive benefit from all the time. So what Mircea Eliade was doing was saying that enlightenment is the only goal and we should ignore what people do in practice, whether it's yogic flying on mats or this posture. And others are saying, no, this kind of practice is precisely what matters. Now we can understand the medical benefits of yoga techniques in different ways. And I'm going to skip through this to just simply move to images. Um, how can a posture such as this have medical benefits? It has to do with the way in which this posture is described. And incidentally, this is a peacock pose. And you may ask why peacock? Well, what you have is the two arms of the practitioner become the legs of the peacock the extended legs of the practitioner twisted up at the end become the tail. And the description of that is interesting from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is a 15th century text. It says, place the palms of both the hands on the ground and place the navel on both the elbows. Balancing thus, the body should be stretched backwards like a stick. This posture destroys all diseases, removes abdominal disorders, cures illnesses arising from irregularities of phlegm, bile, and wind, which is the old humoral conception of health, and promotes the digestion of unwholesome food, increases appetite, and destroys the most deadly poisons. Now, there are two dimensions of this which are critically important, which is the practice of this posture and many others was conceptualized in terms of its magical possibilities of preventing a person from suffering the dire consequences of being poisoned. In other words, this is a statement that is focused on magic, and yet it destroys all diseases because it also prevents a person from getting poisoned. So that's where the transformation of magic into medicine is illustrated in terms of this discussion of posture. So if we turn to a modern practitioner, a contemporary practitioner here um, at a, a yoga school in uh, Australia, but it could be anywhere in the world, she is practicing the peacock pose in order to improve her physical fitness based on this legacy of inquiry, philosophical, physiological, and metaphysical, that whole legacy of elaboration, which connects the subtle body to the gross body. And similarly, this posture here. Incidentally, this is a peacock pose. I'll give you uh, three seconds to think about what posture this might be. They're all named after animals. This is Kukut Asan, the rooster pose or the cock pose. The two arms become the legs, the crossed legs are the wings, and the head is the head of the rooster. Now, there's an important point in the terminology of postures, which is that many postures are not only named after animals, but they're named after the full panoply of organic things in the environment. And what yoga is fundamentally trying to do is to transform the illusion of diversity. 
that is the difference between trees and people and roosters and peacocks and snakes and snails, etc., and to highlight the commonality between them and doing that in a very physiological way. So again, the subtle body and the gross body exist on a continuum. Air and Bran illustrate this continuum, but we can better appreciate the medical benefits in terms of how this animates the body. And here, what I'm going to do is spend about another five minutes describing the physiology of yoga as it relates to the practice of pranayam and asana, and then leave about 15 minutes to engage in a conversation, because I'm sure that you will have many questions about things that you have heard about yoga. And hopefully what we'll be able to do in the conversation uh, that can extend for about 15 minutes will be to dig into the, some of the questions you have in light of this very schematic outline uh, that I am uh, presenting here. But the energy of pran flows through something called nadi. Nadi are conduits that extend from gross to subtle. So the bronchia, the veins, arteries, intestines run parallel to the subtle nadi, the ida, pingla, sushumana, of which there are 80,000. And if we look at this image, which I started with in my title slide, what it is, is a artistic representation of the invisible, subtle channels that animate the body with the energy of prana. And these are highly complex and symbolically rich configurations, and I'm not going to go into them in great detail on that level. But what I want to do is to draw attention to the way in which the subtle nadis, the conduits that channel the subtle energy of life through the body, intersect with the gross channels that are conduits for nervous stimulation, for air, for blood, uh, and for all of the fluids that our bodies are comprised of. And what this diagram here is trying to do is to find that point of connection between the subtle body and the gross body, and to then prepare the body to be able to animate itself in a way by strengthening the nadis in order to withstand the force of enlightenment. Now, there are various ways of doing this, and I'll simply highlight several of them to illustrate how this gets medicalized. This is the performance of a technique that many of you may be familiar with using a neti pot, which is a pot that contains slightly salty water in which you pour the water into one nostril and let it drain out the opposite nostril. Now, the reason you do that is effectively to clean the sinuses. Another technique is to essentially floss your sinuses, which involves inserting a cotton cloth thread into your nostril and pulling it out your nose. Now, this is not a very common procedure in many parts of the world, but certainly in India, where yoga is recognized by the government as a alternative form of medical treatment, this technique is very, very common. And it's not as difficult to do as it may seem. But the point of it, and this is really where I want to end the presentation, the point of it is quite literally to purify the nostrils, as the nostrils represent the point of connection between the gross physiology of air that you breathe through your nose and the ability of the body that has been trained through yoga to transform air into pran. So what this individual here is doing is what yoga broadly is trying to do, which is to develop the body and purify it in a way 
that has benefits that can be realized either on a metaphysical lane, plane in terms of uh, cosmic enlightenment or in much more practical terms through medical interventions such as this, which is swallowing a cloth to swab out the, uh, the, uh, the intestines in order to purify them in ways that involve rotating the different parts of the body in order to cleanse its interior, and then to perform postures in order to strengthen all parts of the body to be able to withstand the transformation of the gross body into something which is beyond this reality. And I'll simply end with this slide here, which brings us back to the way in which yoga is in many ways counter-cultural. That is that it takes issue directly with our misperception of reality. Um, and many people forget this when they're thinking about the history of yoga and certainly when you're practicing yoga. But this image here kind of brings it into focus in a very particular way. One of the things that yoga says in the literature is that all of the social distinctions that we recognize in the world at large, differences of race, differences of ethnicity, differences of social class, differences of gender, differences of all kinds are an illusion. Fundamentally, we are all people of the same elemental constitution. And so even the misperception that our mind is more important than our feet is in this posture quite literally turned on its head to remind practitioners that our perception of social hierarchy, as well as our perception of our body, such that the mind is more important than the feet, or you might say intellectual work is more important than physical work, is a misperception of reality that inhibits our experience of the world as it should be experienced. And so really what yoga is trying to do is to create a perspective on an alternative reality uh, that opens up a perspective that is not easily achieved. So I'll end with that and we'll leave it open uh, to questions because I'm sure um, you'll have questions either based on your experience or anything that I have uh, said in the presentation so far. So thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, the conversation.